Welcome to the Atlantic at Sundance. I'm Shirley Lee, a staff writer with the Atlantic, and I'm so excited to moderate this discussion with first time film directors about their highly anticipated projects premiering at this year's festival. Please welcome Eva Longoria Baston, Chloe Okuno, and Kristen Verlinden. Eva is making her documentary film directorial debut with La Guerra Civile, as in the Civil War, which she also produced. The documentary follows the epic rivalry between the iconic boxers Oscar De La Hoya and Julio Cesar Chavez in the 1990s. Chloe is making her feature film directorial debut with the psychological thriller Watcher, which she also co-wrote. Watcher is about a young woman who just moved to Romania and can't shake the feeling that she is being stalked by an unseen man in an adjacent building. And finally, Kristen is making her feature film directorial debut with the dramatic thriller Alice, which she also wrote. The project follows the story of an enslaved woman who flees the plantation and shockingly discovers that the year is actually 1973. Thank you all for being here today. Let's jump right in. So all of you, as I mentioned in that very long preamble, <laughs> are first time filmmakers in some aspect. First documentary, first feature film, I imagine that choosing the right piece for your opening salvo as an artist is an exciting as well as daunting prospect. So how did you go about choosing what would be your first project or story to tell? Uh, Chloe, I want to start with you. It seems you've always been interested in horror. Uh, your first short film was also about a female heroine who's targeted by a dangerous threat. And I won't go into any more of that because then I will spoil things. So. <laughs> Yes, um, I think I've, I've clearly always had some kind of preoccupation uh, with the darker sides of humanity. I think a lot of it comes from my own anxieties and my own fears. So horror speaks to me. And I think as a filmmaker, it allows me to sort of delve into things that are constantly on my mind. And I always think of it as weirdly therapeutic. Um, because I'm a filmmaker, like most filmmakers, I'm probably a little bit of a control freak. So I think it's a way of exercising control over things that frighten me. Um, so that was a big part, I think, of why I chose this particular project. Um, and I know I've mentioned this before, but it, it did take quite a while uh, from when I was hired back in 2017 to the movie getting made. So, you know, I really responded to the core story um, as you say, it's actually quite simple and, and minimalist. It's about a woman who feels she's being watched, um, knows that the threat is real to her, but is struggles to communicate that threat to the people around her. So I, I definitely connected with that. And, um, and you know, I, I felt like it was such a good opportunity to do a really interesting psychological thriller that sort of allows me to speak to things that I care about you know, from a personal level, emotionally, but also lets me play with the sort of filmmaking that I really love, which is suspense and horror and, and uh, genre based. Now, Eva, for something completely different, <laughs> you've directed television, you're working on your first narrative feature, and you're a prolific producer on top of your career as an actor. So what drew you to make a documentary as your first film? You know, it accidentally happened. I, I was scheduled to have shot flaming hot first uh, my my feature debut and um COVID happened and so we were set to shoot and then COVID happened and so during COVID uh we were doing another rewrite on the script and during that time Oscar De La Hoya who's been a friend of mine forever he said hey you know it's 25th anniversary of this fight we want to do a documentary do you want to do it and I was like absolutely not oh my god no a boxing doc like oh like no and I said what's interesting to me about that fight though was the cultural divide it had in the Mexican American community the Mexican community um and it really uh I remember it in my household like I remember my dad being for Julio and us being for Oscar and I was like but they're both Mexican and they go they're not you know Oscar's not Mexican enough and I always felt like I experienced that as a Mexican American like what does that mean what do you mean um and straddling that hyphen of Mexican American and straddling, you know, navigating that identity. And so I, I was like, you know, that's the lens in which I, I would love to explore that fight. I don't want to do jabs and stats and stuff, but like to talk about culturally what that fight did, I would love to do that. And he said, great. So 
uh, during COVID, while I was waiting to prep Flaming Hot, we, you know, did it pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, it was a lot of archival footage. And and then, you know, we came out with this. I mean, it, like for it being an accident, like, oh, OK, I'll just do this while I'm waiting. It came out so beautifully. And the message and the, the our, all of our subjects and all of our, you know, interviewees were just brilliant and amazing and then it really hit home with so many people who who watch it they go i remember that i felt that i still feel that because a lot of the issues that were brought up in the documentary still reverberate today and so that's kind of how that happened yeah no, absolutely speaking of uh resonant stories chris and i want to turn to you as i understand it you've always wanted to be a filmmaker and have been writing for most of your career alice is based on a, a true story uh why did you choose to step behind the camera for the first time for this story in particular? Because it spoke to my heart on such a deep level and felt so cathartic because growing up in Napa Valley um, as the only minority for <laughs> children, uh, my mom was the first black woman there. So, and we, I grew up on 50 acres and it really, it, I related so much to Alice as an outsider and then moving into a different world and and the, the larger message of believing in yourself and defining yourself on your own terms meant so much to me. But also it was a chance to play in two genres that I love, you know, like gothic horror and then like 70s black exploitation and and the challenge of smoothly from one to the other it just it felt like the right thing and the right challenge and and just uh Alice is I feel like Alice is me and I am Alice and we are one <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah you're you're transcending those boundaries and in, in your film and outside of it uh now before we dive into talking about the films a little bit more I wanted to ask each of you about how you navigating uh, navigated defining yourselves as directors, you know, making that leap. Um, and by that, I mean, Hollywood has been notably in, invested in achieving inclusivity in front of the camera and behind the scenes. Uh, but a recent report conducted at San Diego State University found that despite there being a record number of films from female directors in 2020, the stats dropped last year in 2021. Women comprised only 12% of the directors of the top 100 most popular movies at the box office. And obviously it's been a strange few years for film. Uh, but my question after, again, another long introduction <laughs> is, what has helped you chart your course through Hollywood's persisting obstacles to gender parity and inclusivity behind the scenes when it comes to advocating for your storytelling, especially as women of color? What has been your North Star, your inspiration, your guide to making that step? Uh, Eva, I'm going to toss this one to you first. You've worn so many hats in your career. So let's start with you. Um, yeah, you know, people always think I'm an actor turn director, but I think I was always a director producer who like fell into acting. And so the and I think women are natural directors. I, I mean, I don't know why we're not hired more. We are multitaskers. We're problem solvers in life. I mean, that's just like our natural state. And so that's, you know, two key things in being a director. Um, but yeah, for me, I had the obstacle of overcoming. Um, oh, that's just another dumb actor. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, there's a dumb actor coming on to being a director. Um, but, you know, I really used Desperate Housewives as my film school. I mean, I just paid attention and I asked questions and, you know, I loaded the camera and I was like, what does check the gate mean? And what is a mark? And what is a lens? And what does it do? And why are you doing that? And they literally, they got so tired of me. They were like, can somebody send Eva back to her trailer? Because I just was like, I was like, I didn't go to film school. I'm just going to learn while I'm here. Um, and I think the obstacles for women are real. I mean, they are real and alive. And so that's why I chose to be a producer because I was like, well, I want to hire people. I want to be, I want to hire people. Um, and so anytime I have that chance, every time I produce a TV show, um, I remember producing Grand Hotel and I wanted a, a female DP and they sent me, you know, three names, Bob, Tom, and Phil. And I was like, I'm sure Bob, Tom, and Phil are great, but I'd love just to see a couple of female names. And the studio wasn't hesitant. They didn't go, absolutely not. They said, oh my God, yeah, sure. And then they gave me some names. So they didn't, they're not consciously against us. They are unconsciously hiring who they're used to hiring. 
So we have to build that pipeline. And that's what I want to do is just consciously hire women. Like I just want to con let's, let's pay attention. And anytime you have the opportunity to fill a position, do it with a woman. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of a long way around your question, but that's, you know, you just do it by the way. And, and the first time I was asked to direct was a short film. And, uh, I mean, uh, was it a short film? Yeah, it was a short film. And they said, Oh, you direct this. And I said, yeah. And the minute yes came out of my mouth, I wanted to take it back. I was like, Oh my God, I'm not ready. Why, why did I say yes? Blah. And so I think we just doubt ourselves. Like we're not ready. I, I surely, I don't know enough. And you only learn by doing, you only learn by doing. And so I would say, just go and do it. Yeah. Chloe, uh, I see you nodding and I'm wondering what, what helped you make that? Yes. Or say that? Yes. Make that? Yes. What? Your turn. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I feel like for me, I mean, I, I fell in love with films and I fell in love with filmmakers and I just, I feel like there were certain stories that I desperately wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that kind of keeps me going because honestly, I find that uh, as a female filmmaker, you do have to deal with quite a lot of nonsense in this business. It's kind of constant and it can be very dispiriting, very discouraging. Um, and I definitely have found that I have a really hard time advocating for myself. And it's not good and I'm working on it. But I think a lot of times as women, we do have a hard time standing up for ourselves because we've kind of been trained not to in this really like toxic way. Um, but, you know, even if I'm having a hard time sort of standing up for myself and what I believe, I always try to look at like, okay, I'm fighting for the story that I'm trying to tell. I'm fighting for this movie that will exist at the end of the day outside of me. So that always sort of helps me um, keep going and like find strength when I'm, when I'm struggling. And I really feel like it is a struggle, uh, but women are, you know, half the population. We have such interesting stories to tell. I think we do have a different perspective than men and the world will only be a better place if we're, you know, allowed to tell those stories. So I hope that we make progress and that more people hire us. And if they don't hire us, we just barrel our way on forward and don't take no for an answer <laughs> and <laughs> push our way in. Yeah. Kristen, I, I'd love to hear your perspective as well. I see you nodding too. And I, I also recall in your film and Alice, I mean, one of the through lines of it is Alice sees images of who she could be, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm wondering, you know, what was your guiding light? My guiding light was other filmmakers, but the, the through line for my own life was my heroes were Akira Kurosawa and Andre Tarkovsky and Sam Peckinpah, and they were all men. And so I really felt inspired to be, um, to be a, a, a female fil filmmaker that didn't fall under the shadow of, oh, female filmmakers only make romantic comedies or they only make this or they only make that, but we can actually make masculine movies, whatever that really means, you know? So the films that I've been drawn to and the filmmakers I've been drawn to, um, you know, it shouldn't be defined by sex. It should just be telling the right story for the right character and putting, this is gonna sound cheesy, the care and character. So that's nice. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> he even closed it way better than I did. So I'm like, okay, how do I follow, follow that? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, uh, going off of that, I, I do want to talk about the kind of stories that you're drawn to telling, the kind of characters you're drawn to uh, putting on screen. Um, on the surface, all of your movies are quite different, uh, operating in different genres, different settings about very different central characters. But thematically, watching them, especially back to back for me, um, humble brag, I, I noticed that they... They were all in a way about people who are underdogs. Um, you know, Alice is about an enslaved woman finding herself in the 1970s, seeing a different representation of who she could be. Uh, La Guerra Civil is, is about boxers uh, whose cultural identities shape their rivalry. And uh, as you mentioned, Eva, Oscar de la Hoya in particular, had to reckon with the question of whether he was Mexican enough. Uh, Watcher is about a woman who doesn't speak the language of her new home in Romania and being disbelieved when she shares her fears. So. 
why do you think you were all drawn to characters who experience the world in a different way from everyone around them? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a feeling that is hard to articulate. And I wonder if there's something in your personal experience that informed your interest in this theme. Chloe, I'll, I'll toss this to you first. <laughs> okay. um, I Because I, I know I read that you initially planned on setting this story in New York and then shifted it to a foreign country, which only enhanced the element of this story, this element. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sorry, there's like a loud sound going off in my neighbor's house right now. I can't, <laughs> this happens like every day. Um, yeah, initially the script was set in New York City. Um, and then there was a time when we were talking about shooting it in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I think I would have probably made it some kind of nameless North American mm -hmm. city. Um, and then when I heard that the producers wanted to go to Bucharest to shoot it, I decided to just, you know, rewrite the entire story to take place in Romania, um, which I was thrilled to do, frankly, because, you know, I didn't want to try to make Bucharest mm -hmm. look like America. And I felt like the city itself is so interesting and beautiful and unique. I wanted to film it as it is and really take advantage of that. Um, but also narratively, it ended up unlocking things that, you know, added this extra layer onto the story that became so central in a way to it. Um, and I, you know, I'd had the experience before of living abroad in countries where I didn't speak the language and I, I experienced firsthand, you know, how isolating that could be. Um, so that really spoke to me. Um, but I also felt like genuinely, the more I made the movie, the more I felt like the movie was kind of actually about the experience of me making a movie. Um, because <laughs> I feel like when you're a director, and I'll say certainly when you're a first time feature filmmaker, and almost more certainly when you're a woman, mm -hmm. um, you encounter quite a bit of doubt. Uh, and you oftentimes sort of start to feel like maybe you are crazy. Um, because you have very, you probably have very strong instincts. And yet you're kind of surrounded by Frankly, most of the time on a crew, I would say it is majority male. Um, and I hope that we can change that. But you, I, I really did sort of start to feel like I was having a parallel experience to the protagonist in my movie, being in this country, not speaking the language, you know, sort of struggling against the doubt that was surrounding me as a woman in a, a male dominated profession. And um, yeah, I, at a certain point I was worried, like life is imitating art too much here. Like this could spiral out of control, <laughs> but luckily it, it, you know, we got through the movie and, and hopefully that sort of just, that aspect of it is in there. And, and that's why, even though it's, you know, on the surface, a genre movie that I think is sort of classic in a way, almost a throwback, it, it's still very personal to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kristen, I'll toss to you next because you you mentioned something similar about life imitating art. You felt like Alice was you. You were Alice. Um, mm -hmm. So the same same question. Why do you think you were drawn to a character who who experiences the world in a in a different way from everyone around her? <laughs> Just yeah, growing up in a small town that's primarily. Caucasian and you're the kid at school where everyone's like can I touch your hair because it's cur super curly and you feel um you feel like a fish out of water you feel you actually feel like an underdog uh, underdog because there there is this underlying racism that you can feel here and there so it it um it just it Alice the, the stories, the uh, articles that I read that inspired me to write Alice felt so much like how I grew up that there was a, a connectivity of leaving Northern California and coming to Southern California and actually discovering who I am, discovering my culture in such a deeper way. Because, uh, you know, as a kid, we'd go to San Francisco and that would be the taste of culture and then we're back back up on the farm, you know? So uh, in many ways, it, it, it coming into a new world in Los Angeles felt like how Alice did in 1973, where you see Diana Ross on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, you see Pam Greer, you see all of the influences that can empower you and, and show you that 
oh yeah, that I, uh, there are powerful women of color that can do things and, and have a voice and have a say, and I can do that too. And that's exactly how I felt <laughs> when I, when I left Northern California. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And finally, Eva, I know you, <laughs> you're waiting for this question to be headed your way as well. Um, uh, I, I actually do wonder if you saw yourself in Oscar and, and Julio's yeah. stories in, in a, in a visceral, you know, way, um, you know, why were you, I know Oscar came to you and reminded you that it was the 25th anniversary coming up, but yeah, same question. Why, why do you think you're drawn to well, I think, um, characters like these? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're characters. I mean, you know, when you're doing, um, you know, Verite, it's definitely, you've got to find characters. You, it's still kind of the same, um, a, a format of like, what is this character saying? What is he doing? What is he feeling? Um, but for me, I, I really identified with this um, identity journey, you know, because I, I experienced it. And it's so funny because it's a boxing doc, which is a male dominated industry sport. I mean, everything. And so a lot of the interviews I'm doing for Sundance are like, why you? Why you? You're not a man. You're not a boxer. And I'm like, that's not the lens in which I was looking at it. I was looking at it through a cultural lens. And culturally, I understand this story. And I am the person to tell it. And so, um, you know, being Mexican American, people always go, oh, so you're half Mexican, half American. And I go, no, I'm 100% Mexican and 100% American at the same time. And, um, And so this documentary is almost a a, a slice of what we go through every day as the Latino community. We're not monolithic, but we're painted with the same brush, you know? And, and so I think the beginning of the documentary, you see all the differences between Oscar and Julio. Um, And by the end of the documentary, you see all the similarities and you're like, oh, and I think we as a community have bigger fights. You know, we have a lot of fights that we're going to have to encounter access to education, access to healthcare, access to voting. And, unless we figure out our similarities, we're not going to be able to to fight that fight because mm-hmm. we've got to figure it out together. But on something that both the ladies said, it's so funny because you're always underestimated as a woman in in um, the director's chair. And it is it is manifested in different ways, you know, doing television for 10 years and directing television, moving from set to set, having a different DP, having a different production, like all of that, you get a lot of that in, in like, wow, you know what you're doing. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and to navigate like these ladies navigating their first feature set, um, it's you're navigating egos and, and you're like, if it's not hard enough to make the movie, I've got to babysit these people like I don't have time, I don't have time for that. And what I learned through TV um, is I got to pick people throughout my journey. And when I did Flaming Hot as my first feature, I surrounded myself with people who understood my vision and then elevated that vision. Um, because I think as, as first time, you know, film directors, you don't always get that luxury, but I really had that luxury of meeting all the assholes who came before and said, blah, 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 you don't know what you're doing. Are you sure you want to put the camera there? Do you want to put the camera there? Yeah, I want to put the camera there. <laughs> And so I was, I was lucky in, in, in both of these features, Flaming Hot and La Guerra Civil, that I got to, I got to surround myself with a, um, with La Guerra Civil, with all Latino crew. I had a Mexican DP, I had a Mexican composer, I had a Mexican editor. I had a, like, I was like, it, we're all going to have the same lens. And so it was great. Some people had never done it before. And I said, you know, you haven't done it till you've done it. You know, people go, well, she hasn't really done that yet. Or, you know, you don't have the body of work to get the job and then you can't get the job because you don't have the body of work. And you're like, well, I haven't done it until I've done it. <laughs> you know, and now I'm going to do it. And so you kind of, we have to just, that's the fight that we're going to constantly face, you know, mm-hmm. the next job and the next job and building the pipeline of experience that people require. Yeah, I, I love that you're talking about this, Eva, because that actually leads me to my next question and really my final question. Uh, you know, at the top of this interview, uh, I asked about your North Stars because, like you said, filmmaking can be such an isolating experience if you don't have the, the right people around you who understand. Um, so I asked about your North Stars, your, your guides to taking the sleep to becoming directors. To build off that question, what do you hope your work inspires in other filmmakers, particularly women of color. Uh, you know what, Kristen, I'll, I'll start with you. That they can do it. Kind of like what Eva was just saying that 
you know, you, it's a catch 22. You can't, you can't prove yourself until you do it, but you can't do it until someone says, well, prove yourself. But I think the inspir for, for women of color or any woman from any background to know that fight the good fight, but also, um, don't let anyone define you by their own limited beliefs, mm -hmm. you know? And if you have the talent, push forward. And hopefully what we all do as women and women of color is for a little girl to watch this interview someday or, and go, oh, it's, there is a chance, there is a possibility. So I think it's just inspiring little girls everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chloe, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Kristen. I feel like it's about um, showing people that they can do it. I, I also felt like, you know, growing up, honestly, a lot of the filmmakers who I really admired were men because there were a lot of male filmmakers and there weren't as many fe female filmmakers. Um, but it also genuinely really helped me when I discovered the work of, you know, people like Catherine Bigelow and Mary Heron, um, you know, seeing what those women were doing and seeing that the fact that they had been able to break into the industry, it was inspiring. Um, you know, so I hope that if, if there's anyone who takes any sort of um, strength or inspiration from it, that that would be wonderful. And finally, Eva? Um, gosh, you know, the thing I love about film is it's around forever you know and so you have you do have this legacy where others can find it others can um you know look to it as an example um but yeah i mean i think we do this work because we want to tell stories and i think you know the biggest thing about representation um is if we're only telling or tapping one pool of talent to tell these stories which is white male um you're going to get the same perspective and in this medium today where you have so many outlets for content, whether you're going to your movies going to a streamer or your movies going to theaters or your movies going to a festival, like we get to choose. And the only way to break through and be loud with your movie um, is by having a unique perspective. And so my North Star is always authenticity. I'm authentically a woman. I'm authentically Mexican. I'm authentically, you know, all of these things. And so I, I, I think everything I do has that you know layered on top of it and i think that in the future you know like kristen said that if, if other young women can look to it and go well she did it you know i think it's super valuable very valuable for for somebody to say it's been done before you can do it yeah i mean earlier you said you know boxing is a very masculine thing but it sounds like all of you have your gloves off uh that's probably cheesy. Anyway, uh, we're, we're going to leave it there. Eva, Chloe, and Kristen, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, to read more of our stories and to subscribe to The Atlantic, please visit theatlantic.com slash culture. And you can check out more of our coverage at Sundance right here on The Atlantic's YouTube page and on the Sundance Film Festival's virtual Main Street. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye.